we've, uh, we've been in a series this whole summer. Hey, baby, I see you too. I see you too. So we've been in a series this whole summer called Runaway Believers. And uh, in this series, we've been going verse by verse through the Old Testament book of Jonah. And we end today with a conversation between Jonah and God that I believe is fitting for the moment that we are in um, in our world. Now, have you ever... Have you ever walked into a conversation and immediately when you walked in, you knew you were an intruder? Has that ever happened to you? Like, like, like you walked in the room and you were like, I should not be here right now. Okay. That is how intense this conversation is that we're going to look at. All right. Um, and uh, Jonah is on the side of a hill and he is ticked off. Jonah's upset, he's angry, uh, dare I say suicidal because of what just happened. So let's look at this conversation together. Jonah chapter four, starting in verse five, it says, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his comfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals. And the book ends there. Now, for those of you who have missed it, uh, the setting is the mid-8th century BC. Uh, At this time, Assyria uh, was the dominant world power. Uh, They were perhaps the most violent and cruel empire of ancient times. They were a terrorist state. Um, Assyria uh, was murderously violent and brutal towards their enemies. And Israel had a front row seat to their atrocities because of proximity. Uh, The distance between Israel and Assyria is the same distance between here and Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, Assyria had had exacted a tribute from um, Israel all of Jonah's life. And so not only was Israel uh, witnesses of their atrocities and their wickedness, but they were victims of it as well. And it was this nation that was the object of God's missionary outreach. God came to this man, Jonah, and told him to go to the capital city of this wicked nation, Nineveh, and preach against it, all right? Now, one of the subplots of this book of Jonah, and the thing that makes his story relevant to, it, to us today, is that he was one of three prophets of his day that you would find in the Bible. His contemporaries, Amos and Hosea, were criticizing Israel's king and royal administration while Jonah Uh, was the prophet of God that supported Jeroboam's aggressive military policy to extend the nation's power and influence, right? And so Jonah would have been known not only as a prophet of God, but he would have been known as a textbook nationalist, right? He, He was intensely patriotic. He was highly partisan, yet it was him, Jonah, that God sent to preach to Nineveh. Now, to best understand why God would send this man to do this work, I think what we need to do is we need to juxtapose uh, Jonah's political spirit with the way of Jesus. All right, now hang with me because I want to kind of take us somewhere. This is going to set up um, kind of an overview of the whole book of Jonah, right? But, but Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 uh, preaches a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. This sermon is famous. It, it is uh, Jesus' most famous sermon Um, And it's been referred to as the ethics of the kingdom. It's been referred to as the fundamental recipe for the conduct of the followers of Jesus. 
um, Gandhi and Tolstoy, they were uh, intrigued by uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount. Augustine re referred to it as a perfect standard of the Christian life, right? One source called it a new political possibility. It is, to borrow a phrase, Jesus' inaugural speech to those he has elected to be citizens of his kingdom. And in this message, Jesus puts to rest this nominal, religious, uh, this externally present but internally hollow approach to relationship with God that is not transformative for us and certainly not life-giving to the world. All right. And at the end of chapter 7, um, the end of Jesus' sermon, he references a narrow road, so three things, uh, uh, three things he, he compares. A narrow road that leads to life versus a broad road that leads to destruction. He references a tree that produces good fruit versus a tree that produces bad fruit. And then he references a house wisely built on the rock versus house, a house foolish, foolishly built on sand. Okay, So two paths, two trees, two houses. All right, think about this. Externally, everything looks the same. Everything looks the same, but one path destroys its travelers. One tree poisons its consumers. One house collapses on its residents. And the point Jesus is trying to make is that it's very possible to say that you are a kingdom citizen. It's very possible to self-identify as a follower of Christ, to look externally like the real deal, but really you're on a destructive path, your diet is killing you, and your fall is coming, All right? And so then the question begs, what does it look like to be a kingdom citizen that has the law of God written on our hearts in such a way that it is transformative internally and at the same time life-giving externally? That's really what I wanna talk about today. How can we be sure that we are a people who walk this narrow path, who produce good fruit, who wisely build on a firm foundation? All right, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at Jonah's journey to the hillside uh, because I believe that we can get a picture of the type of people Jesus is calling us to be in the Sermon on the Mount by looking at who Jonah was not, okay? And, and what we're gonna see is a refusal to be salt and light and we're gonna also see a, a posture of superiority at the, the root of both refusals. All right, so before we do this flyover of the book of Jonah real quick, I, I just wanna read something Jesus said about salt and light uh, in his Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 5, 13 through 16 says this. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. You are the light of the world. A city set on the hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a light lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. All right, so the, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah at the very beginning of the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord comes to him, and God tells him to get up and go east to the city of Nineveh and preach against it. But Jonah's first inclination, as we've seen, as we've gone through this together, his knee-jerk response was to go the exact opposite direction, right? He gets up, he runs west. He goes in the exact opposite direction of where God tells him to go. And I want you, we, we, this can't get lost on us. Jonah is a prophet. Do you know what the, the job description of, of a prophet is? Right? A prophet, by definition, represents God to man and speaks to man on behalf of God. Yet when God told Jonah to go say something, he said, no way. And he ran. Okay. He ran. All right. Jonah shows himself to be the antithesis of the kingdom citizen Jesus spoke of in the Sermon on the Mount by his refusal to be salt and light. See, you can tell the difference between a, a, a heart that's been changed internally by the gospel and external religious righteousness by its impact in relationship with the world. <clears throat> Christianity is attracted to and attractive to people in positions that disagree with it. You don't, you don't believe me? 
Think about Jesus. When you read about Jesus in scripture, you read the gospels. Jesus got a reputation of being a friend of sinners. All right, look at Jesus' best friends. Okay, think about it. If you said to yourself, I'm going to pick 12 people and we're going to go change the world. This brother goes and he picks a tax collector, right? He picks a thief. He picks a religious zealot, right, who's a, a basically a, a revolutionary, right? Hangs out with, um, you know, with prostitutes. I mean, this is, this is his crew. We're going to go to change the world. And he picks just a bunch of ragtag folks to go do it with, right? Christianity is attracted to and attractive to positions and people uh, that, that don't agree with it, while religion is turned off by and alienating to people and positions that don't agree with it. See, salt and light are positive, life-giving resources. So here's the question for you today. Question is, are you salt to this world or are you salty to this world? Um, we know what this looks like, right? So uh, there's a ditch on each side here when it comes to salt, right? And when you think about your impact on the people in your life, there's one ditch where you're not salty enough and there's a, another ditch where you're too salty. Now, you've had something to eat before that didn't have enough salt on it, right? And one of the things you think about is something's missing, yeah? That's what a believer should be in an unbeliever's life. An unbeliever should walk around and say, man, there's something missing. And when you enter into their lives, they say, oh, this is it, right. right? But the ditch on the other side is, have you also ever eaten something and it had way too much salt on it? At least the thing that didn't have salt, you can kind of choke down. The thing that has too much salt, you just gotta push away, right? You can't even eat it, right? Are you salt to this world? Or are you salty to this world? Oh, you don't know. Can I help you? Go, go ask your coworkers tomorrow. They'll tell you. Go, go ask your unbelieving friends. They'll let you know. Uh, go ask the people that follow you on your social media news feeds. They'll let you know. Or even better, go find someone that belongs to the opposite political party that you do. We should move on. So, so what is salt? Salt was a precious commodity in ancient civilizations. It created and destroyed empires. Uh, in America in particular, it was a major factor in the outcome of wars. Uh, in Jesus' day, uh, it was both a driver of technological uh, development and a stable source for, of revenue for thriving economies. Uh, I think I heard it somewhere that there are over 14,000 uh, positive uses for salt. Right? But practically, most practically, salt enhances the flavor of food and it prevents rot. Right? There, there was no refrigeration back then, but by spreading salt over certain foods, it served as a preservative to prevent the advance of corruption and decay. Salt symbolizes purity and durability. It halts the spread of diseases and promotes healing. It even has an irritating quality. S salt dissolves slugs. How, how many of you guys have a slug or two in your life that you would like to dissolve? <laughs> Man. You, can, you can be honest, we're in church. It's all right. It's okay. It's all right. Holy people. All right. All right. So let's look at light. All right. What is light? Light is the very source of life. All right, just think about it this way. Nothing is more important on earth apart from the son of God than the sun, all right? Without the sun's heat and light, the earth would be a lifeless ball of ice-coated rock. The sun warms the seas, it stirs our atmosphere, it generates our weather patterns, it gives energy to the growing green plants that provide food and oxygen for life on earth. In a spiritual sense, light is that which pierces darkness and gives illumination to those who need it. It exposes the things that are intended to be hidden. Scripture says that men loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. 
All right. Jesus said, if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. Darkness and night are scripturally synonymous with confusion and lostness and despair. I believe it was the rapper Houdini who said, the freaks come out at night. All right. I'm trying, to, trying to wake you guys up a little bit. All right. And so the people of God, kingdom citizens, are a precious commodity on this earth. We are called to be the difference between a nation that thrives or perishes. We have been commissioned to influence outcomes when it comes to war and peace. We represent life. We represent truth, purity, durability, healing. We are meant to be spread throughout the world to prevent the advancement of moral corruption and to exterminate spiritual darkness. And not only do we light up the world and bring out the flavor, we don't just make our homes and our neighborhoods and our city and our workplaces good, but we bring out the taste. That's what a believer is. We bring out the taste. We give the world to be the, the potential to be the best version of itself. But getting back to Jonah, getting back to Jonah, by running away from God in Nineveh, Jonah was refusing to be salt and light. And salt loses its flavor when it becomes mixed with impurities that contaminate it. And when light is put under a basket, at best, it makes the whole room dark. At, at worst, it burns the whole house down. Jonah runs away, and he's in the middle of a sea. He's in a storm with unbelieving sailors on a ship that's about to shipwreck, which is an accurate picture, by the way, of what a morally corrupt and dim church looks like in the world. This is Jonah in chapter one. See, Jonah was counting on Nineveh's moral corruption and decay, and when God asked him to go shine light, when God asked him to go sprinkle some salt, when God asked him to go love and serve and preach to the people of Nineveh, he knew that it meant the possibility of preservation. He said, I'm out, and he ran, All right? And this is, this is sort of a, it's a pun, so, so funny, but think about it this way. Jonah ran into a storm, almost shipwrecked, was thrown off the ship, was swallowed by a fish, but because he had no flavor, because he was so bland to the taste, even a fish of the sea thought he was disgusting and puked him out on shore. That's messed up. That's messed up. So in Jonah chapter two, Jonah has this conversion experience in the belly of the fish. And upon getting puked up on shore in chapter three, Jonah agrees to go to Nineveh. So Jonah walks on shore in chapter three, and this isn't brought up in the book. Th these are the types of things when you're forced to sit in front of a text for a long time to study it, to like preach it to people. These are the things you kind of pick up when you just get delirious in your reading of something. So Jonah, he, he walks on shore, and if you're paying attention at all, you realize this brother went straight into the city and start preaching. He didn't take a shower. He didn't change his clothes. He just went right into the city. I, I, what did this dude look like? What did he look like, right? Did he smell like he was in a fish's belly? It's a question I have, right? Did they know when they saw him what happened to him, right? See, this, this is why I believe testimonies are so vital. They're so important. See, a lot of us think that we have to completely clean up our lives before we can begin to tell people about what God's done in our lives. We think we need to memorize books of the Bible and that we need to go to Bible college and that we need to know how to answer every question someone would have about God before we can start talking about God. But, but I, wanna, I wanna say this to you, that one of the best sermons in all of scripture is by a man in the New Testament who was born blind. Jesus heals this man and everyone in his community knows he was born blind, but now he sees. And so they're starting to pepper him with all these questions. And eventually he just says, oh, I don't know the answer to your question. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. That's the best sermon. I was blind, but now I see. 
could this be why the people of Nineveh turned to God so willingly? Did Jonah tell them that he was miraculously delivered from a fish's belly? Maybe they looked at him and they said, man, there must be a God because you don't look like where you've been. Maybe that's it. And listen, I, like I, I, I feel God on this, that, that maybe you're here today. You're here today and you're afraid to speak up about the work that God's done in your life because you still have some things that are unresolved. You feel like I'm not qualified to speak. Let me just tell you, the air is thin up here. There's nothing impressive about me and about Aaron. I'm going to throw you in here too. It's really not. All right. One of my goals in life, and I think Josephine, she and I talked about this a long time ago. She sent me something. I think another pastor said this, but another pastor is like my heart. He said, my goal is to disillusion everyone at my church. Like, I just want them to know how, like, imperfect I am. And I think it's important because we all have to know this, that you don't have to have it all together to begin to preach. You don't have to have it all together to begin to tell people what God has done in your life. You don't have to. Maybe you think that because you don't have all your, your act together that you can't speak up, right? The book of Hebrews says, Jesus is not ashamed to call you brethren, right? He's not ashamed to say, you're my family, right? Tell the world what God has done in your life. He will take care of the fishy smell. I promise. I promise, all right? You'll be shocked by how many people will believe your God and trust him for themselves when they realize that you don't look like where you've been. You'll be shocked. See, we don't, think about this. We don't trust perfect people, right? Like when you see someone and they seem perfect, you're just the whole time trying to figure them out. Like, nah, they messed up somewhere. <laughs> right? It's authentic people that we trust, right? That's what you are in the lives of people. Another thing I want us to note about Jonah walking up on shore, uh, scholarship says that Nineveh, uh, uh, one of the, the definitions for Nineveh is place of fish. Place of fish. That, that it got its name from one of the goddesses they worshiped. And so these were polytheistic pagans that also worshiped the god Dagon, who himself was half man, half fish. Right? And so for Jonah to show up to their city by ocean, but not by ship, for him to come on shore by being puked up out of a fish, there probably wasn't a more gangster way to show up <laughs> than to just walk out of a, the mouth of a fish and start preaching. I'd, I'd give my life to Jesus too, right? If I saw something like that. It likely shattered any power they thought their, their gods possessed, right? And so this is true today as well, that when the world sees that their gods are powerless in your life, that they don't control you, that they don't own you, that they don't consume you, they will want to know the answer for the hope that lies within you, right? And so the precursor to the preaching of Jonah very likely could have been that he didn't look like where he had been and the gods they worship had no power over him. That's what a, an effective believer looks like. And then Jonah preaches. Then Jonah preaches. Now this part is frustrating for me as a preacher um, because it seems to me like Jonah was willing to do what God asked him to do, but, but he did it with low effort. You have kids, you know what that looks like, right? You tell your kids to do something and they do it, but you know they're, they're not really, their heart's not in it, right? Jonah preached to them, but to me it looks like he preached in protest. And, no, and with no preparation, with no passion, with no compassion, low effort, it took three days to walk through the city, he only walked one day. And then he preaches the lamest sermon you have ever heard in your life. He goes around, he walks around this city and he says, 40 days and you guys are dead. 
peace, I'm going back to the fish. <laughs> Literally, 40 days, Nineveh's going to be overthrown. Nick, he didn't do no altar call. He didn't pray a prayer of salvation. He didn't disciple these folks. He didn't run a foundations class. <laughs> right? Nothing. He just, bound, he just left. Preaches and leaves. And then the result is every preacher's dream. Everyone gets saved. The whole city repents. They humble themselves. They proclaim a fast. They issue a decree, and God does not destroy them. And now, Jonah is sitting on the side of a hill overlooking the city of Nineveh, and he is ticked off. Jonah's angry. Jonah's upset. Dare I say suicidal because of what just happened. And he says this to God. He says, see, God, this is why I ran. I knew you were gracious and compassionate. I knew you'd have mercy. And, and I love how this reads in the message translation. This is great. Message translation says this. I knew you were rich in love. I knew that at the drop of a hat, you would turn plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. If you won't kill them, kill me. Jonah's fears... Jonah's prejudices, his emotional breakdown, all stem from his blindness to the reality of grace. Now, I told you guys this, the very first message of this series, that one way to define sin is running from God, right? But a one way to define grace is all the activity that God does to intercept our self-destructive behavior. Jonah is blind to that here, Right? And the reality is that if we believe that we have earned grace, we will require other people to pay at least the same price that we did. Right? I'm going to say this again because that was good. If we are recipients of grace because of who we are, then someone who is unlike us will never be welcomed in. This is where Jonah is. Right? See, maybe Jonah thought that he earned his birth into Israel. Maybe he thought that he earned the office of prophet. How about you? Did, did you earn your income? Did you earn the neighborhood you live in? Did you earn your influence? Did you earn your health? Did you earn being an American? Did you earn the time and the days in history that you were born and put on this earth? Did you earn that? Uh, one of the things I love about the Bible is that the Bible is not primarily a story, like a bunch of stories, a series of stories with a moral, right? Now it is that, it, you can get lessons out of the stories in the Bible, but it's more than that. Um, Tim Keller will say this. I've heard him say it this way before. That the Bible is the record of God's intervening grace in the lives of people who don't seek it, who don't deserve it, who continually resist it, and don't appreciate it after being saved by it. Now, we don't know anyone like that, but it's good to see it in the Bible. Okay? <laughs> it's good to see it in the Bible. God engages Jonah in the midst of his pity party, and I'm so glad to see that. Aren't you glad to see this? Yeah. I'm so glad to see this, that Jonah's in this petty tirade, and God engages him. And Aaron uh, hit this so beautifully last week, that, that God entertains these remarks with a conversation, and it reveals God's tenderness. It, it, it reveals God's compassion. It reveals God's relentless grace towards Jonah, the same grace, by the way, that he is extending to Nineveh, right? See, God's mission field is always just as much our hearts as it is the people we think we're helping him reach. Always. And God says this to Jonah. He says, is it right for you to be angry? See, Jonah's angry relapse has to do with an inordinate concern for his nation's political fortunes, right? 
as, and as long as serving God fit into Jonah's plan for Israel, Jonah was on board. But as soon as it didn't, Jonah said, I'm out. It's really important to, to, to take notice of this because uh, as, a, as a pastor, I talk to people all the time who say things like, yeah, I was believing God until this happened in my life and he let me down. And if you're walking away from God because he let you down, you were more committed to God helping you with your agenda than you were with God in the first place. Okay. This is where Jonah is. He turned on God in anger. Jonah's love for his people and his patriotism, which, which were good things, had become ultimate things. You know what that's called? It's called idolatry. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote a book um, called The Four Loves, and in it he hits on nationalism. I love this. He says, an inordinate love for country becomes a demon when it becomes a god. So we see this further into the argument when God appoints a plant to grow up over Jonah to shade him from discomfort. I want to read this again because I, I want us to see everything that's going on with this plant. So Jonah uh, chapter 4. Uh, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. Okay, so again, he's like, he's like in the desert, Okay. Like, and the sun is beating down on you. So for something to grow up over you, that's like very, very helpful. So it eased him up his discomfort. He was very happy about the plant. Verse seven, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, but you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for this great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? All right, so Jonah's on this hillside and he becomes extremely happy about this plant that grows, but then God appoints a worm to attack the plant and it withers. So all over again, Jonah gets upset with God. He becomes angry and God launches into this legendary rebuke. And this is what God says in the, in the last verses of Jonah. God says to Jonah in so many words, he says, you have compassion for plants, but not for people. See, I sent you to preach to the city and you did it but it was all external. Your heart wasn't in it. Yeah, yeah, you preached to the city, but you didn't love the city. Then you come out here and you post up, hope it's, hoping to witness their condemnation. Jonah, you will never get it until you stop weeping for plants and start weeping for people. God was telling Jonah, I'm not just the God of Israel. I am the God of the universe. Right? And we need to hear this today ourselves, that God is not the God of America. He is the God of the universe. I think I can say this on the other side of, of the, the conventions on both sides. Okay? Like Jonah, if we forget that God is sovereign over all nations, we make God small, we, we remake God into our image, God begins to talk like us, he begins to act like us, he begins to hate the people we hate. Compassion for plants over people looks like valuing things that are of benefit to me over other people's distress. Compassion for plants over people looks like desiring my own comforts, even if it comes at the cost of other people's well-being. So you can never effectively preach to a people you don't love. This is why Jesus referred to himself as the greater Jonah. Because while Jonah went outside of the city hoping to witness his condemnation, Jesus went out of the city to hang on a cross to accomplish its salvation. He was the greater Jonah. People over plants. 
And it's not about renouncing politics or becoming apolitical. Right? We're not called to do that. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying we need to renounce politics and become apolitical. Um, actually, the church in the early uh, 19th century, um, the American church in the early, early 19th century, they refused to speak out against slavery. And because of that, they were actually casting a vote for the status quo. Okay. And so not being political is actually being political, right? And so compassion for people actually looks like political engagement. Just take the biblical Jesus with you. That's what I'm saying here. I love the way that the book of Jonah ends because right as the argument is getting really good, it's over, right? God launches into this legendary rebuke and Jonah doesn't even respond. He doesn't even say anything. So why does this book end so abruptly? Worship team, you guys can come back. We're gonna, I'm gonna wrap up here. Why does this end so abruptly? Uh, Sinclair Ferguson uh, was a Scottish theologian. This is what he says. He says, the book is forcing us to contemplate our own personal destiny. It remains unfinished in order that we might, may provide our own conclusion. For you are Jonah, I am Jonah. Tim Keller in his book, The Prodigal Prophet says, it is as if God shoots an arrow at Jonah, but Jonah disappears and we realize the arrow is aimed at us. And so the question is, will you be salt and light? Will you be the kingdom citizen that Jesus is calling his people to be? Will you preach to people out of love for people? Will you stop weeping for plants and start weeping for people? Will you do that? Stand with me. Let's stand. Here's one last thing that I want to mention about Jonah that I think is very interesting. So we know that Jonah ran when he was first called. We know that he endangered the lives of innocent sailors. We know that he was thrown off a ship. We know that he was intercepted by a fish. We know that he was puked up on shore. We know that he preached in a protest, and we know that he threw a tantrum at the end. The question I have for you, though, is, Who wrote the story? Think about this. Who, who wrote the story? Does the book of Jonah say anything about him having an assistant writing everything down on the boat with him? Does it talk about someone being thrown in the water with him? Does it make any mention of anyone being in the fish's belly with him? Does the book of Jonah say anything about someone else besides God on the hillside with Jonah? No. Which means the only way, I mean, we've spent eight weeks just making fun of this guy. Hopefully you've connected the dots that you and I are so much like him. But if you haven't, you've sat here for eight weeks and we have just trolled this guy. But the beautiful thing about Jonah is that the reason that we have the story is because Jonah wrote it down and made sure we got it. Which means Jonah eventually got it. Jonah seemingly misses it from start to finish, but eventually he figures it out. All the running all the attitude that he was giving God, all the frustration, all the anger was no match for the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It was no match. So if you're here today and you are confused or you're angry at God, I just want you, I just want you to know it's, it's quite natural. It's natural. But if you remain in that condition, it will be because 
you do not embrace the gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ alone, the gospel of which Jonah himself was a sign. Hear me here. Jesus Christ is the weeping God of Jonah chapter four in human form. Jesus is the ultimate representation of salt. He was poured out to save us from moral corruption. Jesus is light and in him there is no darkness at all. The Bible calls Jesus the son of righteousness. In him is life and that life is the light of man. Now Jonah's story hits home right now because his issue was moral superiority and national pride. And as we know, it's election season. And so we may be tempted to partner with the political spirit as believers. But let me remind you that politics was nothing, nothing new to Jesus. It was nothing new. In Jesus' time, the Jews wanted political reform for the Messiah. They envisioned their Messiah to be a king that would rule over them and deliver them from Roman oppression. But Jesus came to do much more than that. And so the people of Jesus' day wanted him to sit on a Jewish throne, but Jesus came to die and hang on a Roman cross. And although the cross was the devil's ultimate smear campaign, Jesus today says to us that I will prove my kingship not by winning the popular vote, not by being elected, but by being executed. By being executed. Jesus walked the broad road. Jesus ate the bad fruit. Jesus allowed his frame to collapse and fall for you. And when you receive him and become one of his kingdom citizens, he will transform you from the inside and make you life-giving on the outside. Amen. All heads bowed, all eyes closed as we wrap up this series. If you're here and you would say, Sean, I know that I've been running from God. And I desire to be intercepted by his grace. And to this point, I've not been responsive. To this point, I feel like Jonah, I've been on a ship that's sinking. To this point, I feel like Jonah, that I've, I've, I've been on timeout. I've been in the fish's belly, but I absolutely want to give my life to Jesus now. If that's you and you're here by the sound of my voice, just raise your hand. I just wanna pray for you. I see you, sister. I see you. I see you, man. I see you. I see you. Another one. I see you up front. Anyone else? Five, six hands have gone up. I need to give my life to Jesus. Seven. Another one. Thank you. You would say, Sean, I, I'm a believer. I've been walking with God for a while. But I have allowed a functional savior to come in and to be more God to me than the God of heaven. And I know I need to unseat this thing and give God lordship of my life afresh. If you would say that, slip your hand up. I want to pray for you as well. I pray for you. Amen. I see you. I see you, brother. the blindness of our understanding. We confess the stubbornness of our will, but we confess the foolishness of our thought life, the addiction of our hearts to the things of this world. But 
we just want to echo the prayer of Jonah today and say, salvation comes from the Lord. God, there are people here today that are maybe for the first time ever considering what it would be like to give their lives to you. And I just pray by your spirit that you would begin to minister to them now. That you would begin to show them that this is not just a new philosophy to add to many. This is revolutionary. This will change your life forever. And so as they count the cost, Holy Spirit, would you begin the process of coming in and showing them just how real you are? And my brother and my sister, if you're here and this is you, if you will truly repent, if you will come to God clean and say, everything I have is yours. Forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I repent for my sins. If you will say that, he will come in. And his spirit, spirit will testify with you every day that he is. Though your sins initiated a death sentence, though they set in motion plans of punishment, Jesus executed a program of forgiveness to die on the cross for you. And on the cross, Jesus said to his father, kill me, don't kill them. Thank you, Jesus, for chasing us. Though we run, thank you for chasing us. body to you, God, today. And I ask, Lord, by your spirit that you would begin to help us to see the areas in which we run from you and give us the courage, give us everything we need to return fully to you. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 So our, our, um, excuse me, our prayer team is going to come forward. And if you're here today, if you rose your hand for the first time and you said, I want to give my life to Jesus, I would love for you to come up. Just allow us to partner with you and pray for you. Um, but if you're here and you need prayer for anything, if you need prayer for healing, uh, deliverance, um, if you just need someone to, to talk to, we would love to, to chat with you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming to the Rock of Roseville. Have a great rest of your weekend. Amen. Take care.